Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Claudia Trevisan. I'm the Washington correspondent of the Brazilian newspaper O Estado de São Paulo. Welcome to our discussion of the new World Bank re report, Wage Inequality in Latin America, Understanding the Past to Prepare for the Future. Latin America and the Caribbean was the only region in the world that saw wage inequality reduction in the 21st century. This remarkable achievement can be attributed to the expansion in education combined with economic growth and exchange rate appreciation. Now that the region, the economic growth in the region has slowed down, how can the, these gains be maintained? This is the central question of our debate today. I'm joined by Cynthia Arnson, director of the Latin America program at the Wilson Center, Daniel Laderman, deputy chief economist for Latin America in the Caribbean at the World Bank, and the speakers, Joana Silva, who is the co-author of the report and senior economist for Latin America in the Caribbean at the World Bank, Barbara Stalin at my side, professor at the Watson <coughs> Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University, and Miguel Zekeli, director at the Center for Education and Social Studies in Mexico. I'd like to thank our partners, the Wilson Center, the World Economic Forum, and o Estado de São Paulo. Eu também gostaria de dar um alô em português para os que nos acompanham pela página do Facebook do Estadão. Se vocês quiserem fazer perguntas ou comentários nas redes sociais, por favor, usem a hashtag Desigualdade Salarial. This event is being broadcast live in English and in Portuguese. Please join the conversation asking questions or commenting on the live stream with the hashtag Wage Inequality. Now, please help me welcome Cynthia Arnson. Claudia, thank you so much. Buen dia. Um, I'm delighted to join with the World Bank and our distinguished panelists for a discussion of the trends in inequality in Latin America and the Caribbean, but more importantly, the policies that are needed to sustain these trends into the future. Um, and so I'd like to make a few brief observations to help frame the discussion, especially um, for those who were babies or toddlers in the 1980s when many of us were first reading about these issues in Latin America. Um, a lot of people are probably too young to remember the debt crisis in Latin America in the 1980s, the so-called lost decade. This was followed by policies in the 1990s of structural adjustment that centered on the privatization of state enterprises, the economic liberalization, and reforms that dramatically reduced the role of the state in the economy and cut social spending. With perhaps only one exception, Uruguay, always exceptional, the policies of structural adjustment, which were <coughs> dubbed probably unfairly the, the Washington Consensus, resulted in vast increases in inequality throughout the region. So much so that one of the explanations for the rise of the left in the 1990s and the 2000s, the so-called pink tide, could be attributed to a popular backlash against the policies that had caused so much unemployment, dislocation, and reduction in services. Then came the golden decade of the 2000s with high commodity prices, the surging demand in China um, with growth rates um, of something like 11%, demand for Latin American exports of primary materials, and a determination of both center-left and populist governments in the region to bring the state back in as a provider and guarantor of social welfare. As the World Bank and others have documented so thoroughly, this decade saw historic reductions in poverty, the growth of the middle class, and also important reductions in inequality. Of course, this is a vast oversimplification, but I hope these brief comments help to frame today's discussion about how and why inequality fell in Latin America and what specific policies can maintain or restore those trends, as Claudia was saying, at a time of weak growth overall. 
I'd like to say a special word of thanks to Jacqueline Dolas, all of our staff there behind the lens of the camera, um, our interns, Jamie Shank and Stephanie Aredia, um, Anders Beal of our staff, and also um, Candice, the, I'm sorry for mispronouncing that, uh, De Cruz Rocha, Alejandra Viveros, Marcela Sanchez um, of the World Bank. It's a pleasure once again um, to join with you. Um, our next speaker, Daniel Le Leatherman, I forgot my um, notes here. Has, has joined us due to um, the illness of his boss. We wish Carlos Vey a speedy um, recovery, but we're very pleased to have Daniel with us. Daniel Letterman is a native of Chile. He is the lead economist and deputy chief economist for Latin America and the Caribbean at the World Bank, positions that he has held um, since May of 2013. He's had a number of positions um, of leadership within the bank, the lead trade economist in the International Trade Department, senior economist in the Development Research Group, and prior to joining the World Bank in 1995, he worked for the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Barbara, you and he probably know many people in common. Um, there you go, there you go, there you go. Daniel has published um, widely on issues related to economic development, financial crises, crime, political economy of economic reforms, innovation, international trade, labor markets. Um, he has a BA in political science from Yale and an MA and PhD from my alma mater, Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Danielle, thank you for joining us. Good morning, everybody. It's an uh, honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, we have a nice uh, uh, program here with Cindy's team. And I would like to start by thanking everybody for all of those attending in person, as well as those who are watching us online. Thank you so much for joining us. We're delighted to partner yet again with the Latin American program of the Wilson Center. This time we're gathered here to discuss a new book by Joana Silva and Julian Messina titled Wage Inequality in Latin America, Understanding the Past to Prepare for the Future. And again, I would like to thank the Wilson Center and, and Cindy's team. We have an awesome panel. Uh, Dr. Barbara Stalins uh, from the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown and Miguel Seque director of the Center for Education and Social Studies in Mexico. We're very much looking forward to hearing your insights on this important topic. Indeed, inequality has been a historically important subject for academics, but more importantly for our societies in Latin America and the Caribbean. At a time that our countries are finally resuming growth after six years of slowdown, it is worth stressing that the region achieved something that's truly remarkable during the first decade of the 21st century. It sustained vigorous economic growth with declining inequality. This was in sharp contrast with the rest of the world where the issue of inequality has surfaced to the top of the policy discussions and where most countries struggled with, have struggled with rising inequality in the United States, in Europe, in China, and almost in every other corner of the emer emerging developing countries. Latin America and the Caribbean, in fact, has demonstrated that inclusive growth is attainable. So what caused this unique reduction in wage inequality, in fact, of household income inequality in the region? Does this remarkable uh, development for Latin America and the Caribbean bring important insights that we can share with the rest of the world? What happens now that growth is lower? How can we better prepare for the future of a potentially new normal of slower growth? Those are the main questions that this book seeks to answer. And there are valuable answers there for promoting growth with equity. In this low growth environment, it is important to assess how to move forward with policy reforms. We, we have to ask whether the social gains that Latin America and the Caribbean has achieved in the dawn of the 21st century 
whether or not these gains are sustainable well into the future, and whether lower wage growth is occurring across all segments of the distribution in Latin America and the Caribbean, or is the slowdown disproportionately uh, hurting those who have less? How can further progress be achieved? To answer these questions, it is essential to understand the successes of the past, and a key contribution of this report is precisely to teach us about the past in order to prepare for the future. The discussion of wage inequality is especially important given the enormous inequality still prevalent in our region. Investing in our people should definitely be a priority. We need to work to create equal opportunities for all. One of these areas is the quality of education, which plays a fundamental role in generating the skills the labor market will demand of our citizens well into the future. Again, it's truly an honor to have this book and topic discussed here today at the Wilson Center by such a distinguished group of speakers. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share these insights with all of you in person and online. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like now to invite Joana to present the, the report. After that, we are going to have a half an hour discussion with the panelists, and after that, a 20 minutes for your questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this new World Bank report here at the Wilson Center. This is truly a, a, a pleasure. We are going to, this book is about wage inequality in Latin America, understanding the past to prepare for the future. And this was research led by myself along with Julian Messina there in the audience from the IDV. And uh, we truly want to thank many others who contributed to, to this work. Latin Amer America had a remarkable story during the 2000s. The first part we knew already. The region grew tremendously du during the 2000s at rate of about 4%. But what we didn't know is that income inequality fell dramatically it can continues to fall even today. This was, was what really led Julian and I to write this book. Many countries in the world grew during the same period. China grew a lot. But this came at the cost of higher inequality. There is something special about the story of Latin America, and that's what we are going to focus today. Not all income are wages. Wages are a part of the income. <coughs> and really, this remarkable trend in income inequality was, dro dro was driven by what happened in the labor markets, what happened to wages. Wage differences across workers became more similar, and this was what drove the remarkable reduction in income inequality in Latin America. Let's now focus on three questions that this book tries to address. How did this happen? Why did this happen? And what to expect now in this new context of slower growth? So let me give you a, a brief overview of the main findings of our book. First, we are going to show you that wage inequality fell significantly throughout the region. And this was in sharp contrast to what happened in the rest of the world, where, in fact, <coughs> most countries were struggling with rising wage inequality. This happened mainly for two key reasons, the expansion of education and economic growth, its pattern. There were also other factors that contributed to such a remarkable development, such as the minimum wage and the reduction in informality. And we are going to speak about those as well, but arguing that they had a secondary role compared to growth and education. Today, economic growth is in a new pattern, is in a new, uh, tr in a new, a new level. Uh, since to the mid-2011, growth has slowed down, and this has slowed the, the reduction in wage inequality, but has not reversed it. However, looking towards the future, the slower reduction now calls for action, and further progress will require extra work. And this book w is going to talk a bit about which type of policy actions could uh, lead to continuing uh, um, the large fall in wage inequality. So now let's dig into each of these aspects. So first let's look at the facts, at how wage inequality fell in Latin America. Here in this graph we have 
wage inequality in Latin America on the right since the 90s until today. And we are always comparing it with 2002. This was the year where the trend changed. It, during the 90s, wage inequality was stagnant to increasing in Latin America. But then, after the, the early years of the new millennium, something changed, and wage inequality fell dramatically in the region. It fell by about six Gini points. This is, for example, the difference today between countries in OECD such as Germany and countries in Latin America such as Ar Argentina. This was a large fall in wage inequality. This happened in 16 out of the 17 countries in Latin America. The only exception was really Costa Rica. So it was really a region-wide phenomenon. Moreover, it's in sharp contrast, as I told you, with the rest of the world, here in the graph on the left, where wage inequality was increasing. This was really something unprecedented and something very large. This phenomenon is what we study. So how did this reduction in differences in wages across, across workers in Latin America occur? Two important aspects here depicted in these two graphs. Of course, uh, uh, thank you. The first one is that in South America, where growth was stronger, the reduction in wage inequality was larger than in Mexico and Central America. The second aspect was that wage difference fell because wages of the unskilled workers increased more than wages of the skilled workers. Was a push from the bottom in both subregions, and this is very important. Another very important fact that uh, this book analyzes is that wage differences in economies can fall because skilled workers and unskilled workers get more equal pay, but also because workers of similar skills working at different firms get more equal pay. So we went ahead and did a decomposition of the change in wage inequality in the 2000s between these two components, the part that is due to differences in, in skills, in education, in experience, and the part that is due to sim workers with similar skills making now um, more, more similar wages. Here I'm speaking about the difference in wage between a manager at McKinsey and a manager at McDonald's. This difference also shrank in Latin America. Wages, and this happened mostly between, because wages across firms became more similar, less unequal. And this is a very important as aspect for our study. So just to summarize in terms of facts, the important reduction that occurred throughout the region was, a, was stronger in South America than in Mexico and Central America, was pushed by the bottoms, wages of unskilled workers increased more than wages of skilled workers, and was pushed by more equal wages across firms for similar workers. Let's now, with this in mind, try to understand what drove this remarkable phenomenon. So what caused the reduction in wage inequality in Latin America in the 2000s? The first big driver was growth. And it wasn't just the, the level of growth. Inequality fell because the pattern of growth was different and was very important. Growth was associated with a, with a real exchange rate appreciation. This was pushed by the commodity boom, but uh, also other factors. And this had a key role in one particular aspect, in wages of similar workers, in difference in wages across similar workers. It reduced wage inequality because it reduced wage inequality within skill groups across firms. So let me now dig into this. South America and Mexico and Central America had very different trends in terms of growth during the 2000s. In South America, labor market demand was more dynamic. The region, the subregion grow, grew at about 4.8%, whereas Mexico and Central America grew at about 3.3%. The growth in demand was also accompanied by an, increase, an improvement in terms of trade, fueled by the commodity boom, but also by capital inflows into the region. Through spending effects, as, as money poured into the countries, uh, no tradable sector employment expanded more than the tradable sector employment. 
So e employment in sectors such as services expanded more than in manufacturing with in the tradable sector. And growth acted through the exchange rate appreciation on inequality. Let me tell you how, through its effect on the real exchange rate appreciation, growth led to more equal wages across firms. This occurred through two main channels. The first one, this expansion that I just told you of the non-tradable sector led to more equal wages because wages across firms in the non-tradable sector are more similar than wages across firms in the tradable sector. Second, it reduced wages across firms, wage differences across firms because it led to a decline in export participation. Within the tradable sector and within an economy, the more productive firms, the high in paying firms are the exporting firms. And by, by, by hurting the, these firms, labor, the, by hurting labor uh, demand for these firms and therefore employment, it makes wages within the tradable sector more similar. But there was a second factor. It wasn't just growth. The second factor was the remarkable a a expansion in access to education. This reduced wages across skills, made more equal wages across skills. The, the relative supply of skilled workers to unskilled workers depicted in this graph increased steadily and in a large scale since 1980. This graph might not seem that striking, but let me tell you some facts. Today, in Latin America, most young girls uh, are enrolled in high school. Today, the average level of education is nine years of education. In, in 1990, it was six years of education. This is a big improvement. Through this trend, unskilled workers became a relatively scarce resource as more skilled workers entered the labor market. And this throughout the region affect the gap in wages between skilled and unskilled workers. The college premium, the difference in wage between college educated workers and primary educated workers fell, but fell from a high level. It remains very high. And it fell as bottlenecks were removed in, in access. So now that we have a complete picture, one factor that reduces wages across, uh, wage differences across firms, growth, and one factor that reduces wage difference across skills education, let's now look at other factors, other forces that happen at the same time in the region. At the same time, in some countries in the region, there was a big reduction in informality and big hikes of the minimum wage. This played a secondary role. And they had some impact but not in every country. Let me give you more details. In several countries in the 2000s, for example, in Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, and Peru, the reduction of, of informality reduced wage inequality because those who entered the, inform the formal markets, the formal employment, were the low-skilled workers. However, the reduction on informality did not have and if a strong impact on inequality in countries like Chile or Uruguay. Let's now turn to the minimum wage. The minimum wage increased significantly in many countries in the region. Brazil was certainly a case where this happened. And in the 2000s, when minimum wage increased in Brazil, it reduced inequality by about 20%. However, during the previous period, during the period 95 to 2003, where growth was lower, in fact, minimum wage hike in Brazil increased wage inequality. So really, when it happened was very important. Moreover, in, a, in other countries, such as Peru, such as uh, Uruguay, such as Mexico, the role of the minimum wage is not as important either because it is too low to matter or because it didn't increase during this decade. So just to summarize, the key drivers of the wage inequality reduction in Latin America were economic growth, not just level but its pattern, better education, and then there were other factors such as the minimum wage and the reduction on informality that helped 
but just in some countries. Now, a quick question today is whether the economic slowdown since the mid-2011 uh, is indeed rising wage inequality. This is not the case. Economic slowdown, inequality continues to fall since 2011, but it falls at a slower pace. So the slower growth came with a slower pace of reduction of wage inequality in Latin America, as you can see here in this graph. And this happened as countries in South America became more similar to countries in Mexico and Central America in terms of their reduction in wage inequality. Here in this graph, we, we, de we depict the pattern of change of wage inequality in South American countries and in Mexico and Central America within the region, and you see that now they look very much alike. This wasn't the case of the 2000s, when in, when in South America, wage inequality fell much more. So how to prepare for the future? Let's pause in a, for a moment and think about what is happening to the key drivers of this phenomenon in the, in today. On the one hand, education is continuing to expand. The levels of education remain below those that the region would desire, and education is likely to continue to fall through lower returns to education Wage, in, uh, wage, more wage um, equality. However, growth has slowed down and there is a new pattern of growth and this might affect wage inequality reduction. It might in fact slow this in wage inequality uh, reduction. And this happens mainly through two channels in this framework of our book. The first one, because it fuels the demand in the tradable sector that is more heterogeneous. The second one, because it will promote exporting and by a higher concentration in high growth, in high productivity, high paying firms, the wage dispersion in the economy is likely to increase. And also because just the act of exporting in a firm increases the skill utilization of that firm. Workers for marketing, workers with knowledge of foreign languages are important for exporting and the demand for this type of workers and the respective wage premium is likely to increase as a consequence. Today there is less space for minimum wage hikes whereas the as we can as I just told you minimum wage changes have different effects in good and bad times and in fact in bad times they can have an intended consequences increasing wage inequality as firms might not be able to hire workers at a higher wage and many will have to, might have to be um, driven to informality or not getting uh, the job. So how to move towards continuing growth with equity? Here in this book we argue for a two-pillar approach and both are very important. First we say don't hinder productivity growth. This reallocation that we just told you from less productive to more productive firms improves productivity and has long-lasting effects. So let's embrace it. This can be achieved by removing policies, for example, that protect inefficient firms. This is the case, for example, of considering reforms or of corporate subsidies. It's also important to let more productive firms flourish through more, uh, through better antitrust and competition policies. And don't fear technological change. This can have very good effects on productivity and growth. But be aware, this can increase wage inequality. So don't do just that, do more than that. On continue to expand education, but not just access to education, also the quality. Focus on the public schools attended by the poor. Focus on training for disadvantaged youth. All these will bring skills up for the population and will lead to more inclusive growth. So yes, growth is slowing down. But we don't need to be passive observers. We can do concrete action and through this continue the progress of the 2000s with the lower wage inequality and higher welfare in the region. Thank you very much and here is the link to our report. Thank you.
you, Joana. Well, we are going to start our discussion here, and I think we can do it in the more informal way possible. Yeah. I think we can have kind of a conversation. And start with education. <laughs> that seems to be one of the keys or the key issue, the key driver for reduction in wage inequality. And according to OECD data, countries like Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Costa Rica, already use a significant share of their public expenditure in education. In the case of Mexico, where Miguel comes from, uh, the share is, according to OECD, is the share is of 17.3%, roughly the double of France and Japan. And in spite of that, our students have one of the worst performances at PISA tests. So what are you doing wrong? I think you, me uh, you, you <laughs> could start. <laughs> this one? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Good morning to all, and uh, congratulations to the authors of the, of the book. I recently uh, participated in another event uh, uh, presenting another book by Julian, so congratulations for being so <laughs> productive. That one was on education, <laughs> actually. And uh, I, I think this is uh, uh, certainly an important question, but before uh, answering directly, I think it is important to take a step back and before just uh, saying uh, everything is, uh, all of this is about education, uh, I think that there is still some discussion about the relative weight of education in, in the story. I, I have no doubt that it's certainly important, but many of the facts, and the, the book actually talks about this, uh, many of the facts can also be explained uh, with a hypothesis where more weight is given uh, to the external sector factor, and in particular to the role played by the prices of primary goods, which are basically determined in world markets, and uh, which, I, again, the, the book definitely acknowledges. But, but I, w I, I, I think uh, we should not dismiss that side of the story uh, from the outset. Uh, and uh, well, and uh, actually, when uh, I, I worked in, in the IDB several years ago, I, I started there in 1997. And the reason I was invited to go to the IDB was actually because for the first time, the bank was doing a report on inequality. It was basically the Latin America discussion was much more of macro because the macro issues were very, very relevant at the moment. And when uh, we started analyzing uh, inequality around 1997, 20 years uh, ago, uh, uh, 20 years ago, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the main uh, issue was that Latin America was the uh, uh, most unequal region in the world and that inequality seemed like a fatal uh, destiny for, for the region. There was nothing to do about it. But that's the way it was. And uh, looking at the story today is very surprising starting from that point. Of course, also I think we should calibrate this reduction. It's more or less a 10% reduction in the Gini coefficient, which is very significant, but it doesn't mean that inequality in Latin America doesn't exist anymore, that now we can compare to uh, OECD countries or, or things like that. But, but it is a significant reduction. Uh, so the, the main question here in terms of, of policy is if it is a structural change, for example, through education, that led to this improvement, okay, let's just keep on doing what we've been doing right, and perhaps the inequality reduction might slow down, but it will continue. That, that would be the hypothesis under the structural uh, uh, explanation. But if it is more of a temporary phenomenon, for example, the, because of the role of the external sector, and in particular, the prices of some goods that are produced in Latin America and suddenly uh, had a, a boom, but that boom, which does not depend on the policies of, in the region, is no longer there, then this uh, could be interpreted more as a temporary phenomenon, and the policy response should be totally different. The response under the first would be, let's keep on doing what we've been doing, but under the second, the page would still be more of a blank page, and of course the book is very helpful in guiding the discussion on where uh, policies should go to keep on to, to change the structure of the economy. 
So that's why I, I don't think just going to education as such would uh, solve the would would finish the the discussion. I think there we should still look at the external side very seriously, and I'm glad that Barbara is going to to do that. Then on education, uh, it's not that that easy either because. Uh, one story could be simply that more people getting more educated, then that would tend to reduce the, the wage premium. Uh, and then we could explain the story quite straightforwardly. But uh, it doesn't seem that that is the case in many of the countries in Latin America. Actually, an alternative uh, explanation for the decline in the, in the returns to education could be that the economies of the region are not absorbing the human quality, which there is a huge challenge in, in, in quality, of course, but that they're not absorbing the human capital that is being made available. So if there are more com people competing for exactly the same number of jobs, that could have, as consequence, a, a reduction in, uh, in uh, inequality, which is not the same as a story where there are many more jobs for well-educated people, now we have more educated people, and then inequality declines. It's a very different story. And I think, again, being education central, we shouldn't dismiss the other part of the economies not being able to absorb uh, whatever education is out there, which has certainly been increasing also. And uh, finally, uh, on the so I, I do think it's an issue. We could talk about the quality in education, and I would there direct you to Julian's other book, which is excellent uh, about that and, and really uh, uh, discusses in detail the policies for improving education. Uh, but uh, uh, in terms of the future, I think there's another issue that uh, I don't recall seeing in the book, which has to do with the returns to, to education, which could be crucial, which is that if the returns to education are declining, which, again, it could be for different factors, one consequence to the future is that people might have fewer incentives for investing in education. So this downward trend that we're seeing now and following the line of argument of, of the book, would not necessarily continue if the returns themselves determ determine the, the demand for education in the future. And that would be a red light, uh, definitely, that, that uh, in the education policy area uh, should be looked at. Do you want to make a comment? Or? Well, you seem to be sort of making opening statements. So <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you very much to uh, uh, Cindy and the Take this. Is it supposed to be red at the front? Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's really down. Yes, okay, there we go. Okay, so first of all, thank you to um, World Bank and the Wilson Center for the invitation to be here. Um, I was not paid to say the following sentences. <laughs> I want to this is really a treasure trove of data and smart analysis. For anybody who's interested in inequality, not just in Latin America, but other places as well, I cannot recommend this book too strongly. Um, for other places, it's got some very interesting methodological ideas, and it would be terrific to have some comparative analysis to put alongside um, the information in, in this book. So um, you did a great job, and um, I was most happy that I had a, a reason to read it carefully. Um, I want to, as I said to Joanna the, yesterday afternoon when we talked briefly, just express a little skepticism about one aspect of the methodology. And that has to do with the problems of using survey data to measure inequality. It's especially a problem with household inequality, less of a problem with wage inequality, which is the subject of this book. Nonetheless, they make the argument that the two go hand in hand. Um, I think it's more complicated than that. When I was at ECLAC, we did a, a very large, multi-year, multi-million dollar project on the impact of the economic reforms on growth, employment, and equity. Um, Sam Morley, whom I'd hope to see here today, but he's unfortunately not here, um, ran a very well-known um, expert on income distribution, ran the module on, on distribution. We talked a lot, a lot, a lot about the use of surveys. Now, because they're chopped off at the top, just imagine a surveyor going and knocking on the door of a very large mansion in any city in Latin America. 
Um, if the door opens at all, it's opened by um, a gardener or a guard who sends the person away. You can't get that information. And it may well be that at the household level, we're missing something very important. Um, there's an example right now. Um, the Piketty people just did a study on inequality in Brazil, and they say it didn't go down at all. So there are different things going on, and we, it's not that we shouldn't use surveys. That's the main tool we have. We just need to be a little cautious and see to what extent we can find other sorts of complementary data. Now, let's get back to the issue of education and growth. In reading um, this book over the last few days, I've come to think of it about in the following way, and I'm interested to see if, how you react to this, that we have a, a situation of necessary and sufficient conditions, that education, the increase in education um, since 1980, that's quite a long time ago. Um, that's over 45, it's over 35 years. Um, none of us can count. <laughs> <laughs> um, that that is really a necessary condition for inequality to have finally begun to go down in the Latin American case. But it is not a sufficient condition. We can just keep on, um, I think that um, some of the people at um, Augusto de la Torre, former um, chief economist for Latin America at the bank, um, did some work on this and he gave a presentation, I think in this very room, um, a couple of years ago showing that you can't, you can't explain it something that goes like this with something that goes like this. But this would not have happened if we didn't have the increase in education and the decline in um, the skilled premium for whatever reason. Um, I found convincing your reason, but there may be some others as well. But, th so that's a necessary condition. Um, the sufficient condition, as far as I'm concerned, is the, what Miguel called the external factor. Uh, let's just call it economic growth. And clearly, insofar as that was more important in um, what they're calling the decade of the 2000s, it's actually 2000, they're using 2002 to 2010, 11. Clearly, that was more important in South America. Why was it more important in South America? Because of the opportunity to export, um, especially to China, but not only to China. And that really um, spurred a, a decade-long period of growth um, the likes of which we have not seen for a very long time in Latin America. Unfortunately, it turned out not to be um, very sustainable. And as soon as China starts trying to change their growth model, then um, Latin America's growth has slowed down. Um, let me just say there are lots of things that I think go together here. Um, I think that um, formalization and high growth probably tend to go together. Um, sectoral aspects, um, your very nice analysis of tradables, non-tradables. So it's a constellation of factors around growth that are the sufficient conditions in the way I see things. Um, I just co-edited a book with Alejandro Foxley that came out last year called Innovation and Inclusion in Latin America. And there's a, a very interesting chapter in there, more interesting than my chapter in there, um, by a Korean economist who works on Korea and China. His name is Kun Lee at, from Seoul National University. And he's trying to see if there are any lessons that can be drawn for Latin America from the Asian experience. In a couple of sentences, here's what he says, which I think is very interesting and uh, very telling. That in order to get inclusive growth, you need to have not just education, which is in abundance in the Asian case, you need to have a long period of sustained growth. He says at least two decades, if not more. It's not until you have a long period of sustained growth that wages will begin, begin to be driven up. Now, how does that compare to Latin America? Lots of high growth, we've seen it, but it doesn't last too long. Why doesn't it last too long? Dependence on commodities. We, we all know this story. This is not a new story at all. Um, so I think that this is an interesting thing to add in here in terms of, um, as I say, I said, my idea of necessary and a constellation of sufficient conditions centered around growth. Um, so let me stop here and we can I go right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and there is this question that Miguel raised, uh, the, the commodity boom, you know, that we saw this spectacular commodity boom in the last decade. And with the slowdown in China, there is no indication that we are going to see another commodity super cycle anytime soon. And growth, if you look at the numbers of the projections of the IMF, uh, well, last year the region contract, GDP of the region contracted after two consecutive years of sluggish growth. In 2017, the expansion will be of 1.2%. Next year, uh, no, 1.2% 1, 1 this year. Next year, 1.9% followed by 2.4%, far from uh, strong growth. So how, what is, how is possible to change this scenario without expecting for another commodity boom? Yeah, well, I, I think that the book is very good there at pointing this, the, the final part of, of the future, and especially the, this, uh, these elements that have to do not only with education, but more broadly with the economy. For example, competition, labor markets. Uh, I think the answer is really, really there. Because uh, if, I mean, again, if we, if the explanation is only education, well, let's just, even if it's a lousy education, let's keep on doing it if it's having uh, this much effect. Mm -hmm. I, I would rather go to that other, other agenda. In, uh, and if you think of it uh, as, a, as a system, it makes sense, of course, to continue with education regardless of the other factors. But if you don't do something about the capacity of the economy to absorb that uh, improved education, then the effect, if at all, will be very, very small. And uh, I think there are many illustrative cases in Latin America of how th that this is actually happening. For example, with data for, for Mexico for the, the last uh, two decades, if you look at the number of people that have higher education, for example, that has been increasing, no doubt. Uh, uh, and if you look at any quality indicator, although, of course, it's very low quality in general, the indicators uh, show that that low quality has been increasing. Uh, it, it's better quality now, although it should be much, much better, of course. But if you have better, more people being educated with better education, even if the increase is, is slow, you would expect then to look to see the consequences in the labor market, such as uh, in the Asian economies, uh, as the example that, that Barbara gave. And we're not seeing that. In Mexico, you still have very high informality. Inequality has declined very, very slightly. Growth is very uh, under expectations. So the promise of investing in education only as a way of solving all the development problems is definitely not, not uh, there. So when you look at, at, the, uh, at what is the consequence of having more education in Mexico today, it's not necessarily a better job or a higher wage. There are many people with university degrees that are now performing jobs that they performed when they had only high school education. It's not that education opened the access to a, a new world. And that, again, has to do with the structural elements of the economy, competition, how the labor market works, how investment, where investment is directed, which sectors are uh, more the focus of, of, uh, of government interventions and, and promotion. So I, I would point more to that agenda that it's outside, really, what we conceive as a social sector. But I think that that is really the, 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 the that would really uh, lead us to a discussion where the policies to make a big change uh, are really. So one of the things that sort of, um, I wouldn't say confused me, but um, led me to ask some questions um, was this distinction between what was going, to me it's pretty clear what was going on in South America in this decade of the 2002, 2012, let's call it. Less clear to me what was going on in Mexico and Central America. And when you now say that what's going on in South America is more like what was going on in Mexico and Central America, I think we need to um, study those cases to know what was going right and what was going wrong and if there are things that um, could be done. Um, Miguel's comment about Mexico doesn't um, sound very, um, very encouraging. Um, the whole idea of pro-poor growth, which is a term that's been around for decades, um, is in some ways is what we're talking about here. And the, 
one of the really interesting things about the period, this high growth period, at least in South America, was that it really reduced the number of unskilled workers. And so when there was a demand for those workers, um, wages had to go up more for the poor workers than for the um, richer, better educated workers because there were fewer of them. Um, so that's an interesting um, piece of this story. I have no idea how much that happened in the case of, of Mexico. But I want to um, put another kind of policy on the table to um, perhaps be provocative and perhaps um, see um, what anybody thinks about this. One of the reasons that inequality has been a bit of a taboo subject, despite the IDB um, report that I got out this morning that you were involved in, um, is because inequality sort of implies redistribution, so that poverty is a much safer topic. Everybody agrees that reducing poverty is good. Reducing inequality is more complicated. First of all, the questions of incentives. Some people think that um, too much equality is a bad thing. Um, there was the day um, back in the 60s, 70s when it was thought the only way that you could grow was with inequality because it was only the rich that saved, the Caldorian view of economic growth. Um, but one of the things, and there's a very, fortunately we have a book out on the table um, talking about other books that are, have been done that um, Cindy was one of the co-editors co of, about progressive taxation. Um, in the case of Brazil, we have a very high tax rate. Whether it's efficiently spent or not is a different question. But many of the countries um, in the region have very low tax rates, and most of the taxes are collected through the um, IVA, the VAT. Um, which tends to be, not always, but tends to be regressive. So is a policy, a complement to the policies that you've been talking about in the book and that Miguel just mentioned, is tax pol does tax policy need to be on the, on the table? And if so, what kinds of tax policies might we think about? And does this book help us to, <laughs> to think about some of those? Yeah, and it, it apparently is becoming not a taboo at all. At, at the last meeting of the IMF, the fiscal monitor of the IMF focused a lot on education. And they pr the proposal that they brought was exactly to increase taxation on the rich. Mm -hmm. So and is that a what does anybody efficient think uh, tool? So thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm really excited about, uh, about this discussion. Um, just, just a bit rounding now uh, some, some aspects that we're mentioning. Um, this big expansion of education uh, was really something important because it has long lasting effects and is likely to continue. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but it was also accompanied by economic growth. But let me pause for a moment and celebrate a bit again. So in terms of FISA scores, one would like to be in a higher level, but the trend, like Miguel said, was encouraging, was the, the, as you expand a lot education and you, you have a, a broader set of students in the education systems, you, you expect the PISA scores to go down. And in fact, in the region, they remain stable or even increasing. So this is something to celebrate. And it did contribute to increase to the fall on in wage inequality, which was accompanied by the increase of wages at the bottom that improved life of many. So let's, let's uh, but we are definitely not where we want to be. And now we stand at the crossroad, like, uh, like a study we have on higher education. Now it's time to look at quality issues. So people create skills that translate into higher labor market productivity. So uh, now on the issue of sustainability. The slower growth and its different pattern are definitely likely to affect wage inequality through this different, uh, through, through, through the fact that now we are in a context of real exchange rate depreciation and this affects exporting firms and makes wages in the tradable sector more equal across firms and expands the tradable sector that is more heterogeneous. Um, and this is a fact. So what we say is that given this fact, you need to, to work extra hard. It's not enough to do what you were doing. And even if you do what you were doing uh, what, ec extra hard, you might not uh, reach the, this exactly the same levels because 
you don't have this complementary key factor like Barbara was saying uh, that is necessary also for, for the pattern that we observe. Now, just on the issue of the data. So we use here household survey data because that's the data that is available for a larger period of time and for more countries. But is, is a fact, like Barbara is saying, that it doesn't cover well the top 1% of the society. And it doesn't cover well games of capital or rent. Here, because we are focused on wage inequality, we have somehow of a less of a problem because wages tend to be more dispersed in the society. Um, so we are likely to be capturing well the, the remaining 99% of the economy. Uh, and we are using a measure that is Gini coefficient. And this measure is different from Piketty's that uses the level of concentration of income in the top of the earnings distribution. So this is why we have different, different, uh, different results on inequality. Uh, and uh, and wha what you were saying, Barbara, is true. No instrument is perfect. Ideally, we would like to complement the household surveys with tax records, et cetera, to get a better understanding uh, of the top of the of this distribution. Is there any trend toward more tax information availability in Latin America? Do we know that? So, so tax records are available in some in many countries in Latin America, but they are not publicly available often. They are more available now than they used to be. And we had a study where we had more information on Colombia about the top one percent. Mm -hmm. In theory, by increasing the, the tax rate, you would increase tax collection. But given the high levels of informality in Latin America, this is not guaranteed. Yeah. And some think that m maybe we should operate in, a, in, a, in the tax rate that, uh, that maximizes revenue and then uh, use the spending to, to work on inequality. So these are, these are very um, you know, interesting topics, but difficult ones, no? Mm -hmm. And, and actually, the, the, the tax records, since they cover the formal sector, the problem is that they leave out a big part of the economy, the, and mm -hmm. part of it is at the very top. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And considering the fact that, uh, as Miguel uh, mentioned, uh, some of the key elements were related to the commodity booms, the, the exchange rate, the uh, increase in domestic demand, can this be replicated in countries that don't have, don't experience a commodity boom, have a different situation from Latin America? Is it possible? I think that that's uh, the problem that uh, I don't think it is. It is more of an external factor that doesn't have to do with what the country does uh, as policy. Uh, in several Central American countries, for example, I think it is very illustrative, you have a certain stock of education and distribution of education, and then you have the prices paid for performing certain activities, the returns to education. And what happened, I think, uh, and that explains a big part of that story, is that the prices changed uh, very dramatically because there was a huge demand suddenly for goods produced with low-skilled labor. Exactly as Barbara was mentioning, this is totally opposite to the expectation that was that inequality would decline because you would increase the stock of education of human capital. Here what happened is the stock remained fairly stable, but suddenly the rewards to the lowest skills increased due to this external factor. Suddenly if the factor fades away, well, you will stop seeing that, that uh, trend. And if you did not invest the extra resources to improve your education, to really change the structure of the production uh, of, of uh, the production capabilities, then you would be left perhaps in the same situation as before or with that shock, positive shock. But uh, I think this is not where we would like Latin American countries to go. Uh, we would, it would be much better if there was a structural change that really led to a, a different uh, uh, scheme where more people got educated and that education was appropriately rewarded uh, in, the, in the labor market. Uh, that's for me? <laughs> Let me just add, uh, uh, add to Miguel. So I think it depends on the country where you are. So in countries with very low levels of education, where access, there are still important bottlenecks in access, education can have this positive effect by of reducing wage inequality. 
This happens in low-income countries, for example, and there, if this is an issue, removing these bottlenecks can have a positive effect through the effect on returns to education. In high-income countries, though, this step was already made, and progress now is through quality. So the extent to which it's replicable depends a lot on the level of development of the country in this part on education. And I think this is something that is important to, to notice. And also this point that a lot of the effects occur through more equal wages across firms and the driving force, the real exchange rate appreciation, uh, this is also something that can occur in, in other contexts and can have similar effects. And just a, just a point on this, a last point. The returns on education fell in Latin America, but today a person with college education on average makes 3.4 times more than a person with primary education. So it doesn't mean that he no longer pays right. to go to college. Mm -hmm. It does mean, it does pay. It just pays less from a very high level, higher than any OECD country. One, going back to the um, contrast between South America and Mexico, Central America in the high growth mm -hmm. period. Um, I really think that one could make more use than is made in the book of this distinction. I mean, the, the South American case is so dramatic mm -hmm. that we tend to concentrate at that, including myself. Um, if we did some more work on Mexico where you say that yes, inequality was going down, even though there was not only not a commodity boom, Mexico and Central America were hurt by China, were hurt by China. They were not helped. Therefore, if we spent some more time um, trying to tease out um, what was going on in, we used to call it in when I was at ECLAC, north of Panama and south of Panama. <laughs> to try to figure out what was going on north of Panama during this decade, maybe that would give us some clues mm -hmm. um, as to how to um, keep this positive trend going without a commodity boom. Well, let's open to questions, and Cynthia sure. has one here. Thank you to all of you. I have a really burning question that I feel I'm just sort of jumping out of my skin to ask. What's really remarkable to me is we've heard these wonderful presentations. Not one person has mentioned conditional cash transfers, not one. And maybe the reason for that is that the transfers were intended to increase access uh, to education so that you're, you're sort of skipping over the conditional cash transfers and looking at the effect, which was you know, the greater um, uh, participation in the, in the education system. But I remember several years ago that one of the main explanations for the decline in inequality was not only the growth rates, but these state policies that put money in the hands of poor people. So that's one question. Another question, Danielle and I were sort of uh, chatting about the, the difference between the debate now in the United States over tax reform and levels of inequality and the debate in Latin America. Why do we care about inequality? What is the, what is the issue, aside from the moral issue? I mean, this is sort of a devil's advocate question. Why do we care that societies are unequal? Some other, some questions, and then uh, there, uh, there is a microphone there. Thank you. Uh, very interesting discussion, but I've got a real concern about. Can you uh, identify yourself? Oh please? yes, I'm Chris Gruy, uh, Department of Treasury. Um, there, there's another stylistic fact that you did not mention as you were laying out the, the context, which is the lack of growth in productivity. And during this boom period with the commodities, productivity in Latin America, as I've seen it in the statistics, was essentially flat. It, it barely grew at all, which raises the question then, was the increase in low-skill wages during this period just a redistribution, or was it, and this goes to Cynthia's question about conditional cash transfers, because I've also seen that same uh, research ascribing the 
decrease in the Gini coefficient to essentially redistributional uh, policies that governments followed rather than, you know, in the, the normal labor economics, you, you get higher wages when you get higher productivity. Better education should lead to then greater productivity, which leads to higher wages. But we've got two different stylistic facts that seem to be conflicting with each other. Okay, let's, one more question. Hi, good, uh, good morning. My name is uh, Nicholas Saldias. Um, and I have a question regarding labor institutions as well. Um, so you talk about, uh, in South America, a general decline. But uh, if you look at countries like Argentina or Uruguay, one thing you see is that they restarted sector level collective bargaining. And that would, you know, uh, be very, uh, have a very strong uh, influence on one of the variables you discuss, which is dec uh, the decline in intra-firm inequality in wages. So I'm wondering if you have any data or you have any way of determining the impact of this particular uh, labor institution on inequality in these two countries, which are the only ones in the region that have nationwide sector level collective bargaining compared to other countries in the region, in South America in particular, that, that, don't, that do not have this institution. Well, we have four main topics here. Social transfer, why reduce inequality is important, lack of growth in productivity and labor institutions. Who wants to take the first and which topic? Barbara. Well, I'm far from an expert on conditional cash transfers. Um, I think they work rather differently in different countries. Um, Brazil, as I understand, doesn't do conditional at all. They're just cash transfers, but perhaps I'm misinformed on that. But my view was that conditional cash transfers are more useful in terms of reducing poverty than in terms of reducing inequality via an education channel. It could be, um, again, you wouldn't get, they're, they're talking about wage inequality. So you're not going to get, the, you're not going to get that in. If you're talking about household inequality, then that could be a, a factor in helping to reduce household inequality. The education aspect is so much in the, the future. These are small children. It's good for small children to begin to be educated and for their families to realize the importance, but it's a really long-term process. So I don't think that that's likely to have any impact on wage inequality in the particular period that we're talking about. Um, Let me just say something about your other question and then we can take turns answering different questions. Why do we care about inequality? Um, I frankly think we care more about poverty. Uh, one of the questions which we had on the list but um, didn't get to, not surprisingly, we had a long list of questions, has to do with political impact of inequality. Um, there are, by my count, thanks to the internet, seven, at least seven elections in the next year in Latin America, presidential elections. Does inequality have anything to do with um, politics in addition to being a, a moral issue? I think it depends a lot um, in whether you have the kind of political system where you have populists on the scene ready to take advantage of anything including inequality. Um, and in some important countries in the region, um, there are such people and they can make use of inequality. But they can make use of it regardless. Um, I, don't, I don't know how much, if ever, um, Mr. Trump, for example, mentioned inequality. He was certainly talking about um, poverty and some people being um, passed yeah, over. Behind. But I don't know if he ever used the word inequality. Maybe it's too dangerous. Um, so. One of the reasons one might be, but I think we're less likely to be interested in inequalities for political reasons. But certainly we want to sort of have that in the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I think there were these were very good points. Uh, actually, I think the productivity issue is really at the heart of, of this discussion, and precisely the difference between having these trends explained by greater productivity at the bottom versus just a temporary shock on prices is a key to, to step next to the 
policy implications of the analysis. If it's a productivity story, we would go one way and we would go the other with, uh, if, if that was the explanation and, and uh, there is a different story if it was just a temporary price shock. Uh, but but I think that that is uh, it, it. It is a good, a very good point because it reveals in part also the limits of the increase in education. And let me just give an extreme example that, of course, I don't. Want, this is not a generalization, but it's just something that actually happens. If you have a PhD, uh, 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 somebody with a university degree driving a taxi, versus somebody with high school driving a taxi, perhaps it won't make much difference. And you have that actually happening in Latin America. So the effect on the value added of the provision of that service, I mean, education doesn't make that much of a difference. Actually, perhaps the university degree person might give a, a lower quality service than somebody with, <laughs> with high school or, or a lower degree. So if you have an economy where not enough jobs are being or opportunities are being generated for that education to materialize in greater uh, value added, then I think part of what you see in Latin America is exactly exactly that. It's not only increasing the human capital stock, but having an economy that can absorb it and channel it to uh, in, uh, increase uh, growth and, and speed up development. And uh, I think the, the CCT question is also very, very uh, interesting because it, it has been a part of the story in Latin America. If you go to the household surveys, many of which already identify who has these kinds of, of programs, which have proliferated in the region incredibly. Uh, if you try uh, calculate how much of the income comes from that, it does make a, a difference, but it's not huge. It doesn't explain uh, the whole story. Let's say if you go to these surveys and you take out uh, the income from cash transfers, you still see the inequality decline. Like household inequality. Mm. Household inequality, but, but it also is related to wage inequality through the human capital investment, because the logic of at least the conditional which were the ones that, that started, was that this was a way of investing in human capital, and then you would have greater productivity, et cetera, which, again, hasn't really materialized. Actually, one of the big questions with the conditional cash transfers is that now you have all these highly better educated people, but they're not finding jobs to mm -hmm. put that education in, in, in action. But, but the CCT uh, issue, I think, is broader than, than only that, than accounting for how much of the income. And it has to do a lot with the changes in the political system, at least, uh, I, I think. I'm sorry to give a, a not very optimistic view, but I think what we're seeing is, on the one hand, there's very little discussion on the tax system and how that could be made more progressive. But on the other hand, there's always this argument that, well, if we get some more money, we'll, we'll spend more, and that will take care of, of the problem. But the way the money is being spent actually makes a, a huge difference. Yeah. Conditional cash transfer programs at least had this uh, view of investing in human capital. So you would have a, a short-term effect, but you would also have a longer-term effect on, on, the, uh, uh, on the capacities of the poor. But in combination with the political system, the, the way the political systems are working in, in the democracies in Latin America, what you have now is, is basically a segregated system where a minority of the workers have access to the institutionalized social uh, security systems, with pensions, et cetera, as a right, not as a handout uh, or as a transfer from the government, but as a right because they're working. And then you have in many countries, a majority of the population subject to whatever the government gives them through these cash transfers. And it's linked with the uh, democratic uh, 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 developments because now it is much more rewarding for a politician to go out and give now a cash transfer for the elderly, for the disabled, and, and they go and they, they have the picture, they cut the, the ribbon in the inauguration. It, it's really been capitalized very favorably for many uh, uh, politicians in, in the region. When somebody gets a pension because they have contributed to the pension system for 30 years, you don't thank anybody, it's your right. So the, the, you don't have the politician going to you and giving you the check in TV. So that, that's, that doesn't really uh, give any leverage in terms of the, in the, in the context of the uh, democratic systems of Latin America. So I think they do have, they might have a short term effect, perhaps even a longer term effect over human capital. But I think the picture is now so distorted in that area of, of just saying we'll spend more 
uh, and that will solve the problem. That's not really solving the problem. And it actually might be creating a new time bomb in terms of pressures over the uh, government expenditures that perhaps will have more negative effects in the future. Let me say something about the question back here in the back, um, unionization, collective bargaining, et cetera. Um, traditionally in Latin America, unionization has been a factor promoting inequality. Um, that the small group of unionized workers, and this goes with the formalization as well, because in general, unionized workers are formalized workers. So that that's been a, um, a, a negative thing for the society as a whole, obviously it's a very good thing for <laughs> those who are unionized and can get um, better wages. Now you were aiming at a, a somewhat more specific question about nationwide collective bargaining and does this um, reduce the inequalities across firms, which is one of the important stories that's told in, in this book. Even so, um, maybe it reduces that kind of inequality, but it will um, increase um, inequality between um, unionized and non-unionized workers, um, so it's, it's hard to say. At best, it's probably a, a wash. Um, there's a lot of literature on Europe. Um, the Social Democrats in Europe think that um, national bargaining is a very important aspect of their lower level of inequality, so there's some um, leverage that might be gained by looking at what's gone on in some of the European countries compared to the ones that you refer to here. Do you want to say something? Just, just a couple of points. On CCTs, on the conditional cash transfers, such as Bolsa Familia in Brazil, they, they are designed to affect poverty and they affect human capital formation, but mostly they are designed to affect, to reduce poverty. They have also the second tier of effects by keeping children in school and improving the education levels, and this could have a positive effect, long -term. a long-term positive effect. They're they are not the biggest drivers of wage inequality because they are, in terms of income, a small size transfer. So they did not drove down this massive reduction in wage inequality. But this is not to say that they had a neg negligible effect on income inequality. In fact, they had about, they were, they accounted them plus pensions, which are, have a larger in impact actually. The non-labor part accounted by, a uh, uh, by more or less one third of the reduction in income inequality. So, but in wage no. inequality. In, in income, income, income inequality. Income. Household income. Exactly, income. exactly. So one third of the reduction of income inequality was due to non-labor non -labor transfers. So it includes pensions, which has a bigger effect, and then a smaller effect from CCTs. Um, also, um, why do we care about inequality? Not, inequali not all inequality is bad, and we make that point in the book. Inequality that is bad is the one that doesn't allow you to fulfill your potential, that doesn't allow you to, to seize your opportunities, that doesn't allow it as a poor kid to have a, qu a quality education. So uh, this is the type of, of inequality that, uh, that we, we are concerned about. And in fact, I in Latin America, and even in the Central American Mexican country, um, in Mexico, it, the inequality reduction came with uh, labor markets that were pro poor. Most of the action, the, the biggest increase was in wages of low skilled workers. So uh, these are developments that are, that are important for, uh, to keep in mind when one thinks why, why to care, no? Because this improved the life of many along the education expansion on the society that also raises wages. Then this, this idea of, uh, of productivity, this is exactly what we, why we say that is, there is a two-tier approach. Productivity is really important. And we need to, n don't, don't go against the flow. It's important to protect productivity. That's why we say, look at, at policies that are protecting efficient firms. Look at policies that don't allow productive firms to flourish. Act on those. Don't be an obstacle te to technology adoption. That can improve your productivity and can have long-lasting effects. Also education, improving the quality of education will have productivity effects and long-lasting effects. And indeed, this is a very important aspect and one that uh, the region should care a lot. Uh, I, we have two questions from our online audience. Uh, one about uh, the if, if ha has wage inequality decreased for both women and men? I don't know if you have this uh, response in the report, mm -hmm. and, and another one regarding education. 
uh, in Brazil today, we see many people with higher education out of the labor market, exactly what Miguel was, was mentioning. Is a degree worth it? And government should invest in technical education? Mm -hmm. Who starts? <laughs> so why don't you okay. talk about the gender part if it's in the... Yes. So in terms of wage inequality, we've seen reductions in many gaps in the gap between urban and rural areas, in gap between men and women. But this had a smaller contribution, although not negligible, but smaller, than the massive reduction across skill and unskilled workers or across wages uh, in different firms. So this is a, an important factor. This is a gap that closed in Latin America, but uh, not as important as, as other factors, but important to keep in mind. Uh, in terms How about the increase of women in the labor force? That affected income inequality. So through these non-labor markets, so as more people- I'm calling household inequality, okay, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That had an important role there and was an important right. factor in sure. several countries. Um, so is, it, is a degree still worth it? Definitely. So a college educated person in Latin America still makes 3.4 times more than a person with primary education. This is controlling for all their characteristics from their gender, for where they live, etc. So definitely it does still, it is still worth it. Are we where we want to be in education? No, we want to be better. We want better quality and, and this is a, a key thing to keep in mind. Um, and training is a key aspect because like you said, we don't just care about students in school that, uh, that then arrive at the labor market, but we also care about those that are already in the labor market and they need to improve their skills uh, for better wages and sustainable livelihood. So we definitely care a lot about that. And then in the book, we don't specifically uh, exploit which type of training we should invest on, but we stress the importance of building skills for the workforce. Let me just make one little comment to add on to that. Um, in this book that we did that has some, um, a different chapter, not the Kunle chapter, but a different chapter on education, it's interesting that technical education training was in the past um, an extremely important aspect of the Asian story of economic growth. But here's the downside. As the countries have, as education has increased and as it's now that um, getting an edu a university education is a prestige mark, people are less willing to go to technical schools than they used to be. So one needs to um, figure out how to make them attractive. And it's interesting that I guess in this country, people are beginning to say the same thing. Is the college education really worth it or should I go off to learn to be a, um, a computer programmer um, in a quick course? So maybe there are different ways of, you have to think about marketing technical education if you want to bring that into our package of um, changes policies going forward. Yeah, I, I uh, also would answer that definitely yes, but much less so that it should be, I think, uh, uh, having a, a, a higher education degree. Still, the differentials are very large, 3.6 you, you mentioned, between high school and, and higher education, and that is very revealing. But uh, I think we're still missing two, two elements in the puzzle here that, that would, should make uh, the investment in higher education even uh, more, th more uh, uh, even better. One is that it is not any type of higher education. For example, in many Latin American countries, we still have an excess of people studying to be lawyers, accountants, etc. And there is a, a whole new area of different uh, careers that are more linked with with opportunities, not only in the countries but in in, in the world in general. And uh, uh, the second is that so what part could be supply and the quality, but the other, which I think is the the most important one, and it refers to examples like the one uh, Barbara was mentioning of, of Korea, is that I, I think that in Latin America we don't really have this view that education, and especially higher education, is a strategic investment for something else. It happens more because there's supply that exists, because there's funding, and but there's not really a strategic view. And many Asian countries actually made a big jump when they took this strategic view 
of how, not only invest in education in general, but in what type of education in particular. And there are many success stories like uh, Ireland and many other, uh, many Asian countries where first what the countries did is set a target in terms of developing some sectors of the economy and then really invest as a, as a policy, as a national policy in developing the capacities for, uh, for uh, generating the, the supply of higher education exactly for those sectors where they identified that there was an opportunity. If we look at Latin America, I, I don't see that happening anywhere. And I think that would definitely make a, a big difference. It would have to do with productivity because if you don't just invest in education but in a certain type that you need to trigger the potential of one sector, which would be more a strategic view, I think that would really make a, a bigger difference. And you would perhaps see increasing returns in higher education, which could create greater inequality, but that would uh, set up a totally different type of dynamics in the economy that would lead perhaps to more education, even by individuals, and eventually perhaps even lower inequality. But that would be the good type of inequality that, that you mentioned. So maybe inequality is not so bad. Okay. Well, unfortunately, unfortunately, we have reach the end of our discussion. I thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Joana, for the presentation. I think there was a terrific debate with Miguel and Barbara. And thank you again, Cynthia, and the Wilson Center for having us here. Thank you. be interested the inequality is now going down in China quite sharply. Oh, wow. Oh, really? Yes. Um, it, this seems to be more of a Kuznets kind of story. That's surprising, yeah. Yes. Um, rural, rural to urban migration is a huge part of the story because that's the biggest gap, rural and urban. Mm. Um, and so now... Migration is so yeah. high. As a matter of fact, the main government policy for reducing inequality, 